All right, good morning. Uh, this is our first dive into Romans uh, chapter two in our Romans series. Uh, hopefully you would have ascertained that by the title and the description of this video, I assume you're watching. And uh, we're slowly working through Romans um, because it is the largest of Paul's letters. It's also um, one of the most uh, longest sustained arguments that Paul gives. Uh, and because of that, because it requires us to really follow along the details as Paul unpacks his argument and tells us about uh, how the righteousness of God is revealed in the preaching of the gospel that offers salvation to everyone who believes, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile or an American or a Canadian or anything else. Um, we need to follow the details, and uh, that's difficult to do um, because the tendency with Romans is to pick out a little verse here, a little verse here, and a little verse here, and then let's just kind of build a theology by ripping things out of context. Um, and so we have to do the difficult work of um, really listening and, and, and focusing our mind to get in tune with what um, what God is saying uh, through uh, through Paul, um, his chosen his chosen agent. The apostle of the Gentiles. Okay, uh, so let's just let's just begin. I'm going to share. Okay, we are there. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so today we're going to look at Romans two. Uh, 1 through 16, which is a, a good self-sustained passage. Uh, 16 is a good place to kind of stop for the day. And we're going to look at God's impartial judgment, how God is going to be impartial as the judge. Uh, but of course, Romans 2, if we're going to understand it in context, we have to realize um, somewhat obviously that it comes after Romans chapter 1. No surprise there, but uh, we need to kind of maybe take a little bit of time to recap what happened uh, in Romans chapter 1. So you could see kind of some of the major passages there. Um, in verse 17, for in it, namely in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous one shall live by faith. And then the passage ends at the end of chapter one, that although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So the, the righteousness of God, God's faithful covenant justice is revealed, but part of doing that is that it demonstrates that some people um, are, are guilty, they're sinful, and the sentence that they deserve is death uh, because they practice things that are um, outside of uh, how God has created human beings to live properly, um, but God also in 132 indicts those who give approval to bad behavior. Okay. So you don't even have to participate in it. Um, if you actually tolerate it and say that what is evil is actually good, there's a lot of that going on in society today. Um, then you are considered guilty. Okay. So a lot of this is about judgment. Um, and so as I wrote down here, the righteousness of God, and remember God's righteousness involves uh, God's faithfulness, uh, God's involvement with the covenant. And of course, God as the judge that brings justice ultimately on the last day, but that that uh, that verdict is brought forward into the present when someone believes the gospel. God's faithful covenant justice is revealed in the gospel. And as the righteous judge, God must be impartial in issuing his judgments to each person. Okay? Uh, because if God is someone like a corrupt judge that you could bribe or you could say, well, I have a prestigious family, uh, or I've been a you know, Christian for, for 25, 30 years, or my dad was a Christian, or my dad's dad was a Christian. Um, or some people might, might say, well, look, I'm, I, I was born as a Jew. I'm one of God's chosen people. Um, there are a lot of things that people do to try to um, get the judge to, to give them a different sentence, but God is impartial, and um, that's, uh, Paul has to demonstrate that. And so uh, while the last half of Romans 1 spoke of the unrighteous behavior clearly deserving of death, Paul anticipates that some readers will take the moral high ground and assume that Paul's condemnation only refers to the bad people, not me, a righteous ethical person, 
And maybe you're someone who reads through Romans 1 and you read through what we looked at in the last se session where it talked about uh, God giving people over to their lust uh, or God giving people over to their sins. And you might be looking at that and saying, well, that applies to those bad people. That certainly doesn't apply to me. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we're going to see in chapter two how Paul is perhaps going to turn the conversation towards his readers who are Christians. They are converted people. They are people that Paul presumes uh, they have repented. They have believed in the message of the kingdom. They have been uh, baptized in water and they have received of God's spirit. Uh, Paul assumes that they aren't, you know, evil, unethical unrighteous persons. Um, but it's very easy for religious people to take a moral high ground standing and to look down on other people that uh, are, are clearly demonstrating um, behavior that is unacceptable to God. So where does this lead us? Okay. So we're going to begin in chapter two and verse one. Um, so Paul turns and he says, therefore, you have no excuse every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourselves. Why? For you who judge practice the same things. Okay. Now, what Paul is going to do here in our passage is he's going to employ a prose style called diatribe. What is diatribe? Diatribe actually has the writer engage with imaginary opponents particularly by addressing their objections to Paul's argument. And Paul's going to offer some answers. Okay. So Paul is assuming that some of his readers are going to read what he just said in chapter one and assume that, oh, that only refers to the bad people. I'm not a bad person. I'm taking the moral high ground. And so Paul is going to turn the argument in chapter two into uh, what, what is known as diatribe. Okay. So Paul is going to um, have an imaginary conversation with people that disagree with his position. Okay. Maybe some of those imaginary persons are actually breeding Romans and they're and so Paul is addressing his objections, uh, addressing the objections that might come to his position, or perhaps Paul has taught what he's teaching here in Romans in other places, and Paul is answering the objections that have already been raised in order to make a better argument. The problem when you're writing a letter is that only one person gets to talk, okay? And so by allowing this prose style, this, this diatribe, uh, Paul is allowing for other voices to come in and to address their objections to what Paul is saying, and Paul gets to defend and to answer himself, okay? So that's, that's kind of what, what's, what's going on here. I don't think that Paul is deliberately addressing particular people in his church. Uh, I think Paul is, is having a conversation saying, well, some might, some might be saying this, some might be saying that, um, and maybe there are some of those persons in the church but, but don't think that Paul is deliberately addressing um, sinful people in the Roman church. We don't get that impression. Okay. So the purpose of diatribe is for the readers, that's us, to get the sense of how Paul would respond to feedback to his argument in a media form that allows one speaker. That's the, the, the epistle, the, the, the Greco-Roman letter. Uh, only one person gets to talk there. So perhaps some in Rome held to such objections, which allows Paul the chance to answer these readers. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so we got verses two through three. Okay, and so Paul says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Okay, so we know that. We can all nod our heads and agree. Okay, okay. but do you suppose this, oh, hypothetical man, um, when you pass judgment on those who practice these things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Notice the condemnation there. The person who, who judges other people, but secretly they're also doing the things that, <laughs> uh, that they're condemning. But there's a hypothetical person there, you know, oh man, you know, oh generic person. And so in verse two, Paul says, we know. Okay, and I think Paul, that this is this is Paul giving an agreement that that we can all share. And that when Paul says that, hey, we know um, that the judgment of God is rightly rightly falls present tense, by the way, uh, upon those who practice such things. You should be nodding your head and agreeing. Okay, Paul assumes that we're all on the same page 
on those particular points. If not, go back and read chapter one, where Paul has demonstrated the righteousness of God and that God is, uh, is currently judging and God's wrath is already being poured out on unrighteous persons because of their behavior. Okay. Now, What's, what's interesting here is that when, when you look at the Greek, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting um, little tidbit here. Uh, it actually says that the judgment of God is according to truth upon those who practice such things. Okay. Now, it's, it's, it's kind of strange to say the judgment of God is according to truth upon those who practice evil things. And so, my translation, the New American Standard, translated that phrase is according to truth as rightly falls. Okay. But it's interesting that God's judgment is according to what is true. Okay. It's based on truth. Okay. It's, it's not based on, um, well, it could just be seen if you look at it from one particular way, or if you only uh, ignore this particular piece of evidence, or if you only take into account this particular person's race, or how much money this particular person has or how prominent this particular family is. No, 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 God's judgment is according to truth. Okay. But it's interesting that in my translation, that phrase, according to truth actually gets translated as rightly falls. Okay. I just thought it's kind of an interesting, interesting point there. Okay. Now, however, we cannot think that by looking at those who are especially deserving of the judgment of God for a sinful lifestyle, that we will not ever have to be judged ourselves because the impartial God will judge the righteous and the wicked. Okay. Uh, too often I hear even Christians say that on the day of judgment, God is going to deal with sinners. And that's true, but that's not all of it. On the day of judgment, God is going to deal with everybody. Everybody is going to be judged on that day. Uh, and either that judgment is going to vindicate you either by raising you from the dead to immortality um, and, and uh, ushering you into to God's new world, God's new creation, um, or you're going to be uh, judged and you're going to be uh, repaid according to your sins. But everyone is going to be judged. But judgment in and of itself is not bad. Judgment, the judgment of God is actually a neutral term. Um, you know, because if, if uh, let's, let's, say, let's say you were wrongly killed, uh, then the judgment of God is going to vindicate you. OK, uh, but the point there is that, uh, you know, we don't want to take some sort of moral high ground and think that, well, uh, the judgment of God is only going to fall on those bad people. I'm not a bad person, so I don't have to worry about this sort of thing. Um, that's not how an impartial judge functions. Let's move along. Verses four through six. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. When? In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Or you could translate it according to his works. Okay. Very interesting and powerful passage, okay? So, despite the tendency of those who like to cherry-pick the passages of Paul to suggest that, that Paul did not expect repentance, Paul here speaks boldly about the goodness of repentance and the consequences of an unrepentant heart, okay? I'm saying this because I have heard people say, well, Paul doesn't care about repentance, all you have to do is, blop, let's go pick out Romans 10, verse 9. All you have to do is um, uh, confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. Okay? Look at there. Paul didn't say repentance. Paul didn't say baptism. Paul didn't say live an obedient life. All you, get, you, just, you see what they do? They just cherry pick that. Despite the fact that Paul, pretty boldly here, earlier, way before you even get to chapter 10, says that, um, that God's kindness leads us to repentance and that if you're stubborn and you have an unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath on the day of judgment, okay? So Paul does teach repentance, just like Jesus did, just like John the Baptist did, just like the preaching in the book of Acts continually did, just like we see Jesus do in the letters to seven churches, just like all the Old Testament prophets did back in the Hebrew Bible, okay? This is a, you know, the need for people to change, to amend their ways, to turn around, 
uh, to change their mind, which is what repentance actually means in Greek. Change your mind. If you change your mind, you're going to change your behavior. Okay. All right. So Paul does believe strongly in repentance. Okay. And then he talks here about the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Okay. Uh, wrath for Paul primarily happens on the day of judgment. Okay. There's no wrath before like some sort of uh, like, like there's, there's wrath and then, and then there's the return of Jesus. I've heard some people uh, try to set up their end time timeline to kind of put it that way. That's not how Paul uses uh, the phrase. Uh, primarily, Paul is going to talk about the wrath of God as something that comes on the day of judgment. Okay. It's, it's the revelation of God's righteous judgment. Okay. <clears throat> and, and that's what's going to happen. And, and of course, uh, we don't want to be those persons who are stubborn and have an unrepentant heart because we're storing up wrath. And, and, and this, this imagery of storing up, it's like, you know, um, you know, people put money away, they store up money uh, into an account for when they retire, they can, they can take out that money. Um, or, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on my wife, my wife likes to store up ice cream in the refrigerator. So that when she gets hungry, she'll go and, and have some ice cream. So, so we, you know, we all understand the, the sense of storing something up. Um, but we do not want to have God storing up wrath for us. That is not the kind of storing up you want to have. Okay. Um, in fact, what we want actually is we want to store up treasures in heaven. That's an interesting thing because when Jesus comes, those treasures will come out of heaven and they will come to us. Okay. All right. Now in this passage right here, you can see in the NASB, maybe you've noticed this, the translation I like to use when it uses all caps there, that means it's citing uh, or quoting from the old Testament. Okay. It, I'm not putting all caps there because I want to yell those words out for you, uh, or that I think that they're any more important than the other words of Paul. They're there to kind of remind the readers that uh, Paul is citing the Old Testament. Okay. So to, chapter two and verse six cites uh, Psalm 62, verse 12, and it actually sounds like another passage, uh, Proverbs 24, and it indicates that a final judgment according to works was a clear Old Testament teaching. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to give you some of these. I'm going to give you some passages from the Old Testament that really make this point, okay? Um, you know, some people aren't aware that uh, that God is going to judge people on the last day based on the entirety of the life that they live, and that that was an Old Testament teaching, and it's a New Testament teaching. In fact, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus preaches it, Paul preaches it, we see it in the book of Acts, we see it in the book of Revelation. Uh, that's a, it's a pretty clear biblical teaching, Old and New Testament. So I think this is the passage uh, that Paul is getting this from. Uh, Paul is going to get out of, the, out of the Greek version, not the Hebrew version we're seeing here, uh, where it says, and loving kindness is yours. This loving kindness is God's, uh, God's uh, faithfulness to the covenant, by the way. Why is the loving kindness yours, O Lord God? For you recompense or you repay a man according to his work. That's interesting. God's, lo God's loving kindness, his loving, faithful relationship to the covenant um, belongs to God because he repays people according to their works. That's interesting. You tend to think of loving kindness as a good thing. But part of God being faithful to covenant is that he has to be the judge. And a judge has to... Um, fairly, impartially, uh, but according to the rules, repay people according to their work or according to their deeds. What about Proverbs 24 verse 12? If you say, see, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it and keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? And obviously the answer is yes. God will render or repay to humanity to human beings, according to his work, according to his deeds. And Job has a little bit more to say about this. Let him, that's God, let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. Okay. And the scales there means God is going to weigh me based on my behavior, um, which involves the works that we do, but also the integrity of our mind and our heart. Okay, so this is a pretty pretty clear Old Testament teaching. And what Paul is doing, if I go back and, and look at the passage before, um, Paul is saying that the impartial God, okay, is going to repay each person according to his deeds. When is that going to happen? Okay, does it happen on the day that you die? 
And the answer is no, because on the day that you die, you don't immediately get ushered into the presence of God to where judgment is, is poured out. A lot of people think that on the day they die, some sort of judgment takes place and either they go off to heaven or they go to hell. Uh, that's not a biblical teaching. Uh, on the day that you die, you're dead, you're unconscious in the grave, and you are awaiting resurrection. Jesus comes back, he will raise the dead, and then you will be judged. You'll be judged either to immortality with the resurrection to eternal life, or you'll be judged to um, annihilation and damnation. Uh, but that happens on the day, on the day, right there, verse five, the day of the wrath and revelation. And what's interesting here is that Paul is going to expand not so much on the judgment and not so much on the according to his deeds, but it's this phrase to each person, to each person, because at the beginning of our passage, we've had some people take the moral high ground. They think, oh, God's only going to judge the bad people. God's not going to judge us. But Paul is saying, look here, God's going to repay each person according to their deeds. And we're going to see that, that the, the part of the each person is going to be unpacked further in our passage. Okay. Okay. So we already looked at those passages. Let's move along. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Verses uh, 7 through 11. Okay. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, what do they get? Eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, notice that truth is something you obey, but they obey unrighteousness instead, what do they get? Wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. Notice each person, Jew and Greek, okay? But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why? Paul impacts a statement, for there is no partiality with God. There is no partiality with God, okay? This is a great passage, by the way. This is a great passage that talks about, you know, there are a lot of Christians that, that, that look at the fact that, that, um, that the Bible requires us to demonstrate good faithful works and good obedient works. And I like how Paul here words uh, the way that we're supposed to be living our life, okay? So first of all, he says that eternal life, okay, which actually is the life of the age to come, okay, the resurrection life, never-ending life that belongs to the age to come, that, that life of the age to come, that is promised to those who persevere in doing good, okay? So if you want to be a Christian that is going to have confidence that you're going to make it into uh, the kingdom uh, that will be constantly when Jesus returns, do what Paul says here, okay? Persevere in doing good and seek, continually seek for glory and honor and immortality, okay? Notice, by the way, that if you're seeking for immortality, then you don't have it already, okay? You don't have an immortal soul. Okay. If you seek for something, that means you don't have it. Okay. We're seeking for glory. We're seeking for honor. We're seeking for immortality. And if we do it, then those who seek those things, they're going to receive eternal life. Okay. On the day of judgment. Notice this is based on our deeds. Okay. Okay. Now, wrath, remember, wrath happens on the day of judgment and indignation are promised to those who are selfish and disobedient. Okay. I like the wording there. Okay. They don't obey the truth because truth is not just something you believe. Truth is something that guides your behavior. Truth is, I mean, people think that, well, the truth, the, the, the doctrines don't affect my life. All that God really cares about is, is how I live my life. That is not true. That is not true. Truth is something that you obey. You listen to and you obey. Okay. On the other hand, you don't want to obey unrighteousness, you know, behavior that is not conforming with God's covenant standards. Okay, those people, they don't get eternal life. You know what they get? Wrath and indignation. This is God angry. God's indignation, God's wrath. God is going to be very angry at these people. Okay? All right. Uh, then <clears throat> we see uh, all who do evil will be punished by the righteous judge. And it, it's very clear. Paul is very clear there. Um, every soul of man who does evil. Okay, the Jew first and also the Greek. Okay, so so there's no sort of like um, Jews being the, the the chosen people of God are more important and they get 
uh, they get judged by a different standard. Now, Paul is very clear that if you're a Jew or a Greek, basically a Jew or a Gentile, um, you are going to receive wrath and indignation um, if you do evil. Okay. And the same lack of partiality is shown to those who do good. There in verse uh, 10, glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Okay, so again, Paul's not saying that Jews are going to be judged by one standard and Gentiles are going to be judged by, by a different standard. Um, like, no, no, if you, if, you, if you do good, you seek glory and honor and immortality, um, you're going to get eternal life. doesn't matter what your race is, okay? And remember, the whole point of saying this, that it's to each person according to their deeds, and that the wicked will be judged, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, and that the righteous will be rewarded, whether you are Jew and Gentile, is because of what is said in verse 11. Why are those things true? For, remember that unpacks what Paul has just said, for there is no partiality with God. There is no partiality with God. The, the righteousness of God indicates that God is a faithful judge. He's a faithful judge that is impartial, um, that is not corrupt, doesn't take bribes, doesn't care about what your race is, doesn't care about your family or how much money you have or any sort of prestige like that. Um, God is concerned with, with the overall behavior of our life and the orientation of our hearts. Okay. Let's move along. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and then here is where um, everything so far has been fairly straightforward, but here is where um, interpreters start to kind of have a question mark come in their mind and they start to think, what is Paul actually saying here? Okay. Verses 12 to 13. So we're going to slow down a little bit here. And really see if we can make sense of what Paul is trying to say. So he starts with this word for. Remember, for unpacks what he just said. What did Paul just say? Paul just said there's no partiality with God. Okay. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And then Paul unpacks it more. For, remember that word for, unpacks what he just said. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just or righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Excuse me. Okay. Now, if you're following along here, this should make you kind of slow down and say, okay, what is it that Paul is trying to say? Okay, and I do think here when Paul says law, he's referring to the law of Moses. Okay, the law that when you're talking about Jews and Gentiles, you, the context of the word law clearly means the law of Moses that was given to uh, the Israelite people that are now known as Jews. Okay, so Paul unpacks his statement about the impartiality of the righteous judge who will reward and punish without bias towards any particular race. And in doing so, he makes clear that the law will only be used to judge those under it. Those who are under the law. Who are those that are under the law? Those would be the, the Israelite people um, in the Old Testament, okay? So the law is not going to be used to judge those who are outside of it, namely Gentiles. They're not under the law, okay? So that's, that's kind of the first impression that we get. However, and this is where, you know, if you're, if you're reading and you're following the train of thought, you also would have come to a pause, Paul then says that it is the doers of the law who will be justified, Notice who will be justified, that's future, on the future day of judgment. So how can Gentiles be judged apart from the law and be justified by doing the law? You see the problem? You see the problem that's going on here? Okay. In verse 12, Paul said, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Okay, so that'd be Gentiles, okay? They were not under the law of Moses, okay? Um, they, 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 uh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be judged, uh, and if they've sinned apart from the law, they're not going to be judged the law as their standard, okay? But then Paul goes on, he says, the doers of the law will be justified, okay? So I'll read that last sentence. How can Gentiles be judged apart from the law and be justified by doing the law. And you're sitting there scratching your head saying, what in the world is Paul saying? And here's the question. Who are these doers of the law 
And what does this phrase mean? That's very interesting, okay? We have to read a little bit further to try to figure out what Paul says here, okay? And I'm going to tell you this. When I first started teaching through Romans, I made very, very clear that there are going to be some parts of Paul's argument that he's going to tease out for us, and he's going to get you thinking about, but Paul can't quite answer it because he needs to give some more detail, give some more argument, and talk about uh, the death of Jesus and the gift of the Spirit, and then Paul can come back, and he's going to address this later. This little phrase right here, where Paul defines the doers of the law, is not something that Paul is going to fully explain until later on in chapter 2, and then a little bit further in chapter 8, and then a little bit further in chapter 10, and a little bit further in chapter 13. Okay? But what people do is they read to this point, they're like, I want to know what Paul means. Please, Paul, tell me. And without the context of how Paul further explains this later in chapter 2, and then later in chapter 8, later in chapter 10, and later in chapter 13, they interpret this passage right here in a way that contradicts what Paul says later in chapter 2, later in chapter 8, later in chapter 10, later in chapter 13, because they got too impatient. They did not let Paul unpack his own argument in his own timing. Okay. And so this, this is where the problems lie. Okay. So we could do one of two things. We can sit here and we can say, okay, let's have the patience and not get the answer immediately as to what Paul is saying here. And we can wait for Paul to unpack it on his own time. Okay. Or we can look at those passages and we can kind of have some settling in our heart to what Paul means right now and not walk away. Um, with, with some confusion, okay? Uh, and while typically I don't like fast-forwarding in a show to kind of like figure out what's going to happen without letting the show unfold, I do think it would be good for us to go and to look at those passages so that we can have a little bit of confidence as to what Paul is saying. We can feel like, okay, our interpretation's on the right track. But I want you to understand what's at stake here and why um, interpretations on this particular point go strangely off the rails. It's because Paul teases out something that he doesn't explain here just yet. And you have to wait a long time. Going from chapter two to chapter eight is a long time. And the amount of time that it would take for us to go from chapter two to chapter eight will be another six, eight months. You will have forgotten about this passage by the time we get there. So I think it's good for us to take the time to look at that. Okay, so hopefully you kind of understand what's going on here. Okay, but again, the problem is, how is it that Paul can say that the Gentiles are going to be judged apart from the law, and yet they are going to find themselves as doers of the law? That sounds like it's a contradiction. That sounds like it's a contradiction. Okay, let's move a little bit further. So <clears throat> then, then Paul un kind of unpacks his argument a little bit more. I got this uh, this other word for. I mean, I mean, Paul is just like digging down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, four. Okay, and he, and here's going to be the, the the verse that we're going to probably spend the most time on trying to understand. When Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these these persons, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that which they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternating, accusing or else defending them. Okay, so this is going to be one of those places to where I'm going to, to kindly suggest, and I very rarely do this. I only do it when I absolutely have to. I'm going to suggest that there's, there's some ambiguity in the original language that can point in a couple of different directions, and because interpreters historically have not been able to follow Paul's argument, they have gone in one particular direction that is just completely contradictory when you later see clear, obvious, simple things that Paul says. And so let's let's talk about this here a little bit. Okay, so I, I underline the, the part that is interesting, and you might have a version that might say something a little bit different, but we're going to talk about this, okay? So, but this is, I, we really need to, 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 to sharpen our focus and really zone in to what is being said here, because it's a little bit complex, but it's vitally important to Paul's argument. I'll do the best I can to, to explain it for us, okay? So the, the, the underlying sentence says, Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law. we got two verbs there, having and doing. 
having and doing. Okay. And so we have this, this phrase instinctively. Okay. And I am actually going to suggest to you strongly more than suggest, but I'm going to strongly argue that this word um, instinctively is actually very misleading. Okay. Because it sounds like when you're reading this, that Gentiles just, we just by nature do what the law says. We just instinctively do what the law says. But let me tell you that that doesn't work. Gentiles instinctively don't circumcise themselves. Gentiles instinctively don't keep kosher. Gentiles instinctively don't rest on the Sabbath and take pilgrimages to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast like Passover. That, 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 that doesn't make any sense. That's not it's so, so you see like even that, like it just, it just, it's, it's weird. It just, it doesn't make any sense to us. Okay. Okay. So the better way to translate this, and you can look up in the lexicons and it'll say that what this phrase means is by nature. Okay. And by nature means by the circumstance of your birth. Okay. Now, some people think that by nature means instinctively. Okay. We just by nature do certain things, but this particular phrase by nature actually has to deal with the way that you are naturally born in a particular circumstance of your birth. And I'm going to show you how this works. Okay. Those who are by nature circumcised, they are ethnic Jews. Those who are by nature uncircumcised are by nature Gentiles. Okay. That's how it works. So by nature deals with the person's ethnicity that they have as a circumstance of their birth. Okay. So you can see how that's very different from, I instinctively do something. It's a nature, not as in like, I'm naturally through instincts, but the nature in the course of my birth. And I'm going to show you how this works. The same phrase, this word for, for nature. Okay. Which is the Greek word feces. Okay. It also shows up later in our chapter, which we're not going to look at all today, but in chapter two, verse 27, I want you to see how it shows up. It gets translated this way. He who is physically uncircumcised, that word physically is that word that's translated instinctively back in verse 14. So what does it mean to be by nature uncircumcised? It means you're a Gentile, but notice you're not instinctively uncircumcised. Okay, so you can see how instinctively it's just not a good translation, but but there it's like those who are physically uncircumcised. That's this word that gets translated instinctively here, but both mean by nature. But you can see there in 227, it's very clear to see what it means to be by nature uncircumcised. By the circumstance of your birth, Gentiles are by nature uncircumcised. Okay, so you can see that it has nothing to do with instincts or just I'm naturally inclined to a particular type of behavior. It has nothing to do with behavior, nothing to do with behavior or instincts at all. It's the race that you have as a circumstance of your birth. Okay. So chapter two and verse 14 could also be read, quote, when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things of the law. And that makes a little bit more sense. When the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, meaning they're Gentiles and they're born not under the law, they're based on the circumstance of their birth. They're not born as Jews. So they're not born under the law. They're born outside of it. So they don't possess the law by nature. Okay. So, uh, so the, the, the by nature, I think, actually is associated with the having of the law, not with the doing the things of the law. Remember I showed you in verse 14 that there are two verbs, have and do. And so the question is, does this phrase by nature, is it, is it modifying the possession of the law or is it modifying the doing of the law? Okay. And that this, the point here is that this is actually ambiguous in Greek, okay? Uh, even though your translation seems, this, this particular translation wants you to think two things. First of all, they want you to think that the by nature has to go with the doing, because they actually put it after the word do, okay? And they also want it to be more of an instinct rather than something that's associated with the race that you have in your birth, okay? I know this is a little bit complex, 
Hopefully I'm explaining it in a way that makes sense. Uh, if not, we can pick up the questions uh, when they come up. But I'm going to do a little bit more to, to kind of unpack this and make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay? Because again, this is vitally important to Paul's argument because Paul's trying to show how it is that, that God is impartial regardless of, of your race. So how can Gentiles born without Torah be doers of the law? And, and, and notice here in our, in our passage, they have the works the work of the law written in their hearts. How can Gentiles who don't have the law be doers of the law and have the law written on their hearts? How is that? Okay. All right. So let's, let's look at this a little bit more. Okay. So here's the ambiguity of, of, of translation on this. I'm going to do the best I can to explain um, what we have here. I'm going to see if I can actually use our little colored, uh, let's use the pen best that we can with this. Okay. So, what I want to show you here is the way that translations have, have taken this phrase, and you can see it here, um, right here, in the, the New American Standard, we have instinctively, okay? The, uh, the, the Christian Standard Bible, we have instinctively. The ESV, by nature. The, the New American Bible, um, by nature, okay? Uh, right here, the NET, okay? We have by nature, okay? The NIV by nature, okay, uh, the New Revised Standard, instinctively, the Revised Standard Version, uh, by nature, okay? Now, in the Greek, it's ambiguous. Does the phrase by nature, which I think is the better translation than instinctive, okay, does that modify the having of the law or the doing of the law, okay? That's, that's the key thing here. So I want you to note how the translations have, have taken this. So in the New American Standard, the very top, the, the NAU, that's the New American Updated Version, the 95 version. Notice how they translate it. Um, we, have, we have the word have and we have the word do. There, they put the by nature or the instinctive with the doing of the law. So I'm going to circle do, okay? Christian Standard Bible, right there. They put a comma after law and then they have instinctively do. So they associate it with do, okay? The ESV, uh, they put a comma after law and then they have by nature do, okay? New American Bible, those who do not have the law by nature observe the prescriptions of the law, okay? There, I think they're actually connecting it with the having, the possession of the law. And I'm gonna make the argument, I actually think that one is correct. I actually think that's what Paul is actually saying here. Okay, uh, the Net Bible, okay, who do not have the law, comma, do by nature things of the law. So they make it very clear that they think it has to do with the doing. Okay, the NIV, when Gentiles who do not have the law, comma, do by nature the things they associate with the doing, not with the possession. New Revised Standard, when Gentiles who do not possess the law, comma, do instinctively. The Revised Standard Version, an older version, okay. Uh, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature with the law. So again, it's by the doing, okay? So you can see here, most translations associate it with the doing of the law and not with the possession of the law, okay? That's how most of them have, have taken it that way, okay? Now, um, in, in, in the Greek, it's, it's, it, it, I actually think by looking at this, it's easier to see how it actually is closer to the possession, okay? So I know... Um, I know all of you are super Greek scholars and you can, you can read all of this, but, but maybe for the one or two people that are reading that, that don't know this, uh, I'll, I'll help them out at this point. Okay. All right. So, so this, this is the first part of verse 14. Okay. So Otan um, means when, uh, Gar means for, and we have uh, Ethni, that's, that's Gentiles, Taz is, is the, the Gentiles. And then we have me, Namu, Ekonta, Fisi. Okay. That's not law having by nature. Okay. So we have for when the Gentiles not having the law by nature. And then we have ta tu namu um, pi usin. The things of the law do. So notice here, okay, this verb is the verb to have. This ver this word right here, it's not a verb. Um um, is the word by nature, okay? And the word to do is way at the end of the sentence. So why is it that all these translations, 
will assume that the by nature should go with the doing, and, and many of them actually translate it after the doing, when actually the word is actually connected and it's so close to the possession of the law, okay? I actually think when you look at the Greek, it's much more likely that Paul is saying that these are Gentiles who do not have the law by nature. So the, the possession of the law deals with the, um, the sorry, the, 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 the by nature deals, in my opinion, with the having and the possession of the law, which makes sense because the by nature deals with the circumstance of your birth. Gentiles, by the circumstance of the birth, do not have the law. They're not Jewish people. They don't, they, they're not part of the, the, the covenant people in that sense, okay? So my, what I'm trying to show here is that in the Greek, the... Uh, the doing is so far away from this word nature, even though the English translations, as you can almost systematically see, are trying to get you to see it in a different direction, okay? And I don't think that's the natural way that you would read this. It's connected with the word having. It is very farly separate, far, it is, <laughs> uh, it is, it is uh, separated quite far from the word doing, okay? So, in my opinion, and I know it's ambiguous in Greek, but, but in my opinion, I think that Paul is saying here that when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, meaning they don't have the law by the circumstance of their birth, do what the law says, and then Paul goes on, okay? But you can see that is very different than a translation like the New American Standard, which I, I like to, to champion, but I think the New American Standard is wrong here. OK, it's not the, it's not Gentiles who do the law instinctively because Gentiles don't do the law instinctively. They don't instinctively circumcise themselves. They don't instinctively uh, rest on the Sabbath and keep kosher and, and do these, you know, observe Passover. They don't do that. It doesn't make sense. But it makes much more sense if by the circumstance of their birth, they don't have or possess the law. That makes much more sense. Anyway. I know it's a little complicated. I hope that I've explained it in a way that's, that's clear. If not, we can we could pick up some clarifying questions in the Q&A after. Okay. Okay. But you see, this, this is very difficult to do without having things in front of you for you to see. Okay. Now, Paul in this phrase is talking about, he's talking about Gentiles. They're not born with the law, but they're doers of the law, and they have the works of the law written on their heart. And when Paul says the works of the law written on your heart, that should immediately connect you to the Old Testament promises of the new covenant. Okay, so here in Jeremiah 31, 31, God says, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant. But this covenant, which I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. Okay. So this is God writing his laws on the heart of his people, not dealing with the old covenant, not dealing with the Mosaic covenant, but with the new covenant, new covenant. All right. Later in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 32, 40, God says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them, but I will not turn away from them um, to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts. Okay. So again, it's, it's th this reverence. Is going to be in their hearts. God's going to write his laws on their hearts. Ezekiel has something very similar. Ezekiel says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Okay. So notice the new heart where God's going to write his laws and it's associated with the new covenant also deals with the reception of the Holy Spirit. Very important. Because notice here, the reception of the Holy Spirit is part of the new covenant. The new covenant is God not writing laws on these tablets, but writing his laws on the hearts. And Paul is saying that we're seeing Gentiles who have the law written on their hearts. And these Gentiles, based on their birth, they were not born under the law, but they find themselves strangely, to our surprise, being doers of the law. How is that possible? And this is where we have to look ahead. And I told you that, uh, that, again, Paul is only teasing this out here, but we have to look ahead in chapter 2 and in chapter 8 and chapter 10 and chapter 13 to see what Paul means by this. Okay, so this is a little bit of preview of what we're going to look at next week. Okay, 
uh, 2, 27 through 29, Paul says, uh, and he who is physically uncircumcised, who's that? That's a Gentile. If he keeps the law, will uh, he not judge you? Who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law. The point is, what's more important, possession or actually doing? Clearly, Paul says the doing. For he, the Gentile, note, noted here, is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward of the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And actually in Greek, it's the in the secret Jew. Okay. And the circumcision is that of the heart by the spirit, not of the letter. Okay. So Paul is saying, okay, you, you there's someone who could be keeping the law here, but they have a circumcised heart. It's by the Holy Spirit. It's not by the letter of the law. Okay. And he actually says, these are God's true people. They are secretly Jews, secretly God's chosen people, but in the secret Jew, they're not outwardly defined by flesh, by circumcision. So here, Paul, again, is, he's teasing it out a little bit more that it, that the people who are physically uncircumcised as Gentiles, okay, can be circumcised of heart, can do this by the spirit. And that's really important. And it's not by the letter. Okay. Paul is going to tease us out a little bit more in chapter eight. Paul says what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh. That's because of our flesh. God did. Okay. How did God do this? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemns sin to the flesh. Why? So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, in us Christians. And Paul here says us, referring to Paul as a Jewish believer in Jesus and the Romans who are combined church of Jews and Gentile believers in Jesus. Okay. How is the requirement of the law fulfilled? How are we doers of the law for Gentiles? We are those who don't walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. Notice there, if you are walking according to the spirit, the requirement of the law is being fulfilled in you. You could be a doer of the law, even if you're not observing the letter of the law. You are doing the law if you are walking according to the spirit. Notice how the spirit there, which is given in the new covenant conversion, is the key factor. The spirit allows us to live this life of fullness and obedience that they did not have under the old covenant because the flesh, the flesh is weak. Okay. And he says in chapter 10, he says, for Christ is the end slash goal. We'll talk about that later. Um, when we get to chapter 10, Christ is the end and goal of the law for righteousness. Namely that's for covenant membership. Okay. To everyone who believes everyone that's Jews or Gentiles. Okay. All right. So covenant membership is for everyone who believes who shows faithfulness. Okay. But the righteousness Based on faith speaks as follows. And then Paul's going to cite the Old Testament. I'll come back and talk about the, 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 the circumstance of that citation. But I'm going to read the passage. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, and who will descend to the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your heart and sorry, in, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. What is the word? That we, Paul, and the apostles are preaching, that word is not the Bible. That word is the gospel. The word that brings about faith that they're preaching is the gospel. Okay, now, these citations here are from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Guess what? Deuteronomy 30 comes after Deuteronomy 29, 28 and 27 and 26, okay? So uh, we, we don't have the time to look at this. You're just going to you're gonna have to... Take this down in your notes and go and check it out for yourself because this would take a whole nother hour to demonstrate, but it's very easy to see with a very straightforward reading. In Deuteronomy chapters like 27, 28, and 29, Moses gives a list of blessings. If you obey the law, here are all these blessings. And it's like blessing, 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 just a whole list of them. And then he says, if you disobey the law, here are a list of curses. Curse, 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 curse. And the final curse that's listed is exile. And then the passage goes on and God says, I know you're going to be disobedient. I know that you're going to be cursed. And I know that the, the exile is going to take place. Like God already predicts it's going to happen. Okay. But then he says, after you've broken the law, 
after you've gone into exile, how do we bring about covenant renewal? And then that's where all of these passages show up. They're going, they're going to be out in exile. They're going to be looking for a word from the Lord. They're going to be looking for direction from God as to how to be God's people. Okay. How do they do that after they've received all of these curses? They've broken the law. The law has been broken. The covenant has been broken. How do they find covenant renewal? And then that's where all these passages from Deuteronomy 30 show up. They are after the breaking of the covenant, after the exile. And what Paul does is Paul interprets these passages about where are we going to go find this word? Are we going to are we going to have to go off to heaven to get it? Are we going to have to go down to the the point is is it really far? Is it so far that it's out of our reach? Is it way up in heaven? Is it way down in the abyss? But it, the passage says no. The word it's near to you. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. And Paul interprets that as the word of the gospel that is being experienced right now in the preaching of of Jesus and the apostles. Okay. And so right there, the way that the covenant is, is going to be understood the way that, and by the way here, righteousness, which again is, is covenant membership on the other side of the Jews breaking the covenant is involved with the word, with the gospel message, the, the message of the kingdom of God that they are preaching. Okay. So you kind of have to read um, Deuteronomy 27, 28, 29, and 30 to kind of see how that's happening, why Paul's pulling those passages out. But the thing is, Paul expects his readers to, to know that little passage of Deuteronomy. Uh, most people don't, in my experience. Um, so that's kind of why we need to do that there. But again, we'll spend more time talking about this whenever we get to chapter 10. One more passage um, to make this point. This one, I think, is easier to see, Romans 13. Oh, nothing to anyone except love for one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. That's, wow, really? I fulfill the law when I love my neighbor as myself? Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet. If there's any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Notice the phrase, you love your neighbor as yourself, okay? That sums up the commandments according to Paul. Guess what? You know what, what Jesus said when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. There's continuity here between Paul and Jesus, who both think that the loving of your neighbor as yourself is the summation of the law of Moses. And here, if we, by the Spirit, in obedience, are showing the obedient, faithful life by showing love to one another, then we are fulfilling the law. We can only do that when we are big, being led by the Spirit, which is why in Galatians 5, when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit, and he lists them, what is the first evidence of the Spirit? Love. Okay? So what we've, we've demonstrated there by looking in chapter 2, 8, 10, and 13 is that according to Paul, those who are in Christ and possess the Spirit are doers of the law, even if they are Gentiles who never have even heard of the law of Moses. The law pointed to the fullness of life and obedience to God that comes about when one believes the Christian gospel and lives according to the spirit. That's a very key part. Living according to the spirit is very important, okay? These persons are essentially doing what the law of Moses always wanted of God's people. That's Paul's argument there. Okay. I, I told you it was complex. I told you it was difficult. But then we get to the last verse of our main study. Okay. 2 verse 16. Okay. So back to kind of Romans 2, 1 through 16. Okay. So at the end of this, still in the same sentence, still in the same breath, Paul says, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Okay. Period. Full stop there. Okay. So in the history of interpretation of Romans, People have read Romans 2, and they said, it sounds like Paul is talking about all these things that you have to do. You have to seek for glory and immort immortality. You have to persevere in doing good. You have to be a doer of the law. And Paul later is going to talk about faith. So maybe Paul in chapter 2 is setting up something that cannot be achieved. It's impossible. It's inevitable. No one is ever going to be able to get in that way. So Paul's going to give us an easier way, namely by believing in Jesus. Okay. But modern interpreters have said, no, Paul is actually 
telling something that's true. He's not setting up some sort of argument only to knock it down later. This is not a hypothetical category that is later going to be dismissed because he says here that all this is going to take place with Christ Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> all right. And then Paul says here that his gospel spoke of the coming day of judgment. Okay. Notice right there. According to my gospel, there's going to be a coming day on that day when God is going to judge the world. Okay. God is going to judge the secrets of men. Okay. And God is going to do this through Christ Jesus. Okay. Very important. Okay. Uh, and again, I'm just pointing this out because some people think that Paul's gospel is only Romans 10 verse nine. That's not true. Paul tells us right here that his gospel also includes the final day of judgment, where there's going to be a day of judgment and all of God's people are going to be judged. And that judgment is going to be handed over to Jesus. Okay. Uh, and of course, Paul's already detailed his gospel in the first five verses of Romans. So now Paul has talked about his gospel in a couple of different places. Okay. All right. And then the cosmic judge, that's God, will bring order to the world through another. God is going to bring it through King Jesus, Christ Jesus. Remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is the title for the anointed king, the Messiah. It's going to be through King Jesus. Okay. Okay. Not the emperor of Rome, but King Jesus. Okay. That's so, so God is, is judging through another. God has passed over that prerogative of judgment as the righteous judge uh, to the, the human Messiah. Very important. Okay. And then, of course, it's going to be on that day, on that future day, because Paul's gospel dealt with that future day, because Paul's gospel was the gospel of the kingdom that deals with that future day. Again, I have to keep saying this because there are a lot of people that read Paul that think that Paul didn't preach the kingdom. Paul only talked about believing and confessing Jesus. That's not true. Paul said, according to my gospel, there is a day coming in which God is going to judge the world and God is going to do it through a human being, Christ Jesus. Okay. That's really important. Okay. So we looked at a lot of stuff. Um, I think we could walk away with three applications, three things from this text that we can pull out and apply to our lives right now. And this is just as applicable today as it will be 10 years from now, as it was 2,000 years ago, very applicable things. Number one, an unrepentant heart, which potentially hidden from the notice of those around you, will be laid bare and revealed by Jesus the judge when he returns to consummate the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to honestly assess if we are stubbornly living in sin or disobedience, choosing to repent and find forgiveness before it is too late. Paul said in Romans 2, 5, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for the day of wrath and indignation of the righteous judgment of God. Okay. All right. If we think that we can do it because it's hidden, that doesn't matter because we just read in 2, 16, that God is going to reveal the secrets of men on that day, and he's going to do it through Jesus. We can't have a stubborn, unrepentant heart. Those things are going to be revealed on that day, and God is going to repay us according to our life's deeds. And if you wait till that day, it's too late. It's too, too late. Okay. As we read this here, um, we need to honestly assess. We need to have you know an honest assessment of our life. Are we quietly and secretly living in disobedience and sin? If so, there's an opportunity to repent. And God is gracious to forgive us if we change our behavior, ask for forgiveness, and orient ourselves to where the teachings of Jesus and the Holy Spirit are now going to direct us. Number two, the life of the age to come, which is a better way of talking about eternal life, will be given to those who seek for glory and honor and immortality. Glory and honor and immortality are gifts from God. So we need to orient our thinking and behavior towards seeking the things that only God can offer. Okay, there are a lot of things in the world that the world is able to offer, but only God can offer lasting glory and honor and, of course, immortality. Okay, um, and we have to seek for those things. Okay. We got to orient our thinking, we got to orient our behavior to a lifestyle that seeks for glory and honor and immortality. Okay. And how do we do that? We're allegiant. 
We're faithful. We're loyal. We're obedient. We're being led by the Spirit. We're being disciples of Jesus. Just, just, just continue seeking. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's, his, that's the behavior uh, conforming to God's covenant. And number three, lastly, Paul's gospel clearly detailed the final day in which Jesus will judge the world in righteous judgment, which, by the way, is a prerogative shared with him by the Father. If our version of the gospel we preach does not sound like Paul's version, then we need to reevaluate our script and conform to the language used by Jesus' chosen apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, and I'm saying this because there's still some people that say all you got to do to be saved is do whatever Romans 10 verse 9 says. They pluck one little verse. They ignore everything that Paul has said in chapter 1, everything that Paul has said in chapter 2, and it doesn't sound like Paul's gospel. They're taking one little statement, one little part of a sentence, and they ignore everything else that Paul says. I'm not saying that Romans 10 verse 9 is, is unimportant. It's very important. But they're taking one little part there, and Paul's gospel dealt with a day, that final day, the day that Jesus comes back, the day that Jesus comes back to consummate the kingdom, to raise the dead, to judge, to vindicate the righteous, and to punish the wicked, okay? So if when we preach the gospel, we're not sounding like Paul's gospel, we need to look a little bit more closely at what Paul is saying, and we need to follow in his example. It's not just his example. Remember, Paul is Jesus', Jesus chosen apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, um, hopefully that's enough to, to get us um, moving in our Christian life. I'm show and uh, open some things up for questions and comments. Let's open the screen up a little bit here. All right. <clears throat> Any, uh, raise your hand if you'd like to be called upon and I'll do the best to help people out here. Um, hi, Joshua, go ahead. Uh, Give us your question here. Man, here I am. Wow, that was awesome, Dustin. Um, first, I want to emphatically express my appreciation to your commitment to excellence and engaging the text. It's, it's obvious that you've grasped the expanse of the grammar and the cultural context. It's incredible. It's something that I really look forward to uh, when, I, when I deal with your material. I would like some uh, clarification on that expression that you used earlier. Um, by nature, uh, being the equivalent of the circumstance of birth. Is that a reference to the sociocultural or socio-religious environment that a person is born into? Being in contradistinction to what would be or the other interpretation that it was instinct, which would be complex, unlearned behavior. And you're saying that by definition, Gentiles cannot intuitively perform the works of the law? Um, so... I, I, I start with the definition of the word, the, the, uh, and then, then what I do is I use that, the, 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 um, the example of uh, Gentiles instinctively don't do the law as a, as a further way to demonstrate the absurdity, in my opinion, of, of one particular interpretation. So, so this, this, this word, uh, um, fisi, um, is, is extremely rare, like less than a dozen times in the New Testament. I think it's like 10 times together, most of them in Paul. Uh, and so it's really rare. And so for us to get a feeling as to what it means, we have to just kind of go line by line by line, see uh, where Paul uses it. That's why I showed that in 227, it was also used there to describe uh, it's a, those who are uncircumcised and then the word by nature, same word that's used there, but it's the NASB translated it differently. I don't know why, uh, but there it's very clear. We can see exactly what it means there, what it means to be by nature uncircumcised. That's not something that's instinctive. That's not an instinctive behavior. It means something that's just uh, by the natural order of, of the circumstances of your birth. And I got that definition from uh, the BDAG lexicon. That's not my own definition there. So the, the lexicon, uh, the lexicons will point this out. Um, but it's the, the key thing is that the, the word is, is very rare. Uh, it's mostly used in Paul. And so we can just look at all the places where it's used to get a better sense as to uh, how it works. Um, but what you'll note is that it, it, it has to do with um, the circumstances of people's birth uh, and where that puts them. It's not with I'm naturally inclined or instinctively inclined to a certain type of behavior. That's not what the word means in the other occurrences. Um, so that's why the 
<laughs> the the by nature, which is which is a correct translation, that ambiguity in English got moved to in some translations instinctively, uh, and I think that's what what created the problem. But my, in in my experience, um, basic readers of the Bible have not been able to kind of like sift through and discern what actually is going on there, and they just think well instinctively. Gentiles are obeying the law of Moses, um, and then Paul's argument falls apart into confusion. Um, Got it. So, so that's is, so. Is that the reason why this has led some individuals down the interpretative trajectory that that's referring to an innate moral conscience that exists in people who incidentally or accidentally perform the moral righteousness of the law? Yeah, that's that, that's that's what they do. The problem, though, is that Paul is very clear to define this behavior as having the law written on your heart, which is drawing on new covenant categories, which only happens with the possession of the Spirit. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's not something that people innately have when they're born. Okay, the gift of the Spirit is something that happens at Christian conversion, uh, and the law written on your heart is something that happens in the new covenant. Okay, so you see how they have to ignore all those parts. And how I, I try to point out in all the other places where Paul builds on this argument, the fact that it's by the Spirit, by the Spirit, by the Spirit. Paul's very clear this is a, a new covenant, New Testament, something that is in Christ with the gift of Jesus and the gift of the Spirit that's actually taking place. It's not something that was taking place in the Old Covenant, and it's not something that people instinctively do when they're born. That just, does, wow. that just, like that, that, that just doesn't, that I don't think that is a charitable reading of the argument that Paul is giving. Okay. And I could be wrong, but I, but I'm, I, I, I am trying to follow Paul's argument as closely as I can. That was a home run. I appreciate that. That was very insightful. Very grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Okay. That raised a lot of questions. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to go in order from what I see here. So I'm going to go uh, Paul NT John Dean Ray. Okay. Uh, Paul, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you're still muted somehow. I'm not sure. Maybe you're muted on your end. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Great. Okay. Scott button on the headphone. Um, so, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for that. I, th- I thought that was, that was really good. Um, and uh, that exact verse there that you, you just talked about there, um, I thought... Previously, I had written on the heart. Um, previously, I'd understood it as um, that Gentiles, not even Christian Gentiles, but just everyone in general, um, would have th- would would be able to tell uh, good from bad, um, and choose which one to do, and then they would be judged by that by how their conscience would accuse them and and when they stand in front of God, if they say, if they one time, for example, decided not to kill somebody because killing somebody was a a bad thing, you know, um, if they decided that once, but then later went and killed somebody, they couldn't say to God, wait, wait a minute, I, I didn't know that was a bad thing. And God could say to them, your conscience already told you it was a bad thing before and you went ahead and did it anyway. So that was the way I understood that that was but I, th- I think your your translation there with the not having the law by nature and it replying at and it actually applying to Christians who who have got the um I think that that, that makes good sense um looking at the examples you gave there about um by nature you know having the law by nature and those not having the law by nature um and yeah, I absolutely agree with it. When when we see where it says um, the righteous requirements of the law, that goes back to exactly what what Jesus says about um, loving your neighbour as yourself. Um, that is the the requirement behind all these laws and loving God above all else. Uh, the, this, I mean, and all these laws and and the righteous requirements of the laws. I mean, I'm just reflecting on that. I mean, these are universal truths. It's a sad state of affairs that God actually had to tell us that these are the right things. You know, even if God hadn't told us, they would still have been the right things, loving your neighbors, yourself and so on. But God has told us and uh, 
uh, even if we don't feel like obeying it sometimes. Um, most of the time we should realize that it's the right thing to do and just do it. But when we really don't feel like it, our fallback is that we have been commanded to. So that <laughs> never, never go any further than that, because once you cross that threshold, you're sinning. So that's that's our that's our last defense, if you like. Um, but g going beyond that and seeking for the glory and honor, um, I, th I think is 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 a uh, is taking that that further and actually being very proactive and not just in the situations we come up against, but actually going out there and helping those that that really do need um, help. So yeah, anyway, I'm I'm wondering about now. Um, so yeah, I also noticed that your your translation when you read um, second, uh, sorry, chapter two verses four to six, your translation said, "Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance." Now I've got the NRSV version, and it says that that God's kind, the kindness of God, is meant to lead you to repentance. So. The fact that God doesn't judge us there and then for everything that we do, and if, um, and when we then go out and judge others <laughs> for what they do, you know, um, we're, we're, we're storing up trouble for ourselves, especially when we do these things ourselves. Um, but the, the fact that God isn't punishing us there and then is because to give us a chance to lead to repentance and come to our end of a life um, repentant. And... Uh, the, the whole judgment thing as well, um, reflecting on that. I mean, the judgment is just a decision, a weighing on the scales of what you've done in your life, you know, the good and the bad. Um, and so we should actually be striving to be completely righteous in this life and not just expect that that's something that God does in the flash of a moment at the end. No. There's judgment there for what we do, good and bad. So that, that was something else I was just reflecting on there. Um, let me see, there's something else. Yeah, see when you talked about being judged according, according to works, and works is just everything we do. You know, you can, you can believe in your spirit, you know, um, but believing is, uh, well, faith is continuous belief. And if you believe that, Jesus as your Lord, then we belong to him as Lord and he has the right to command us to do the, what, to tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So we can't say we believe without also doing. Um, I think that's, that's my point there. So it's, it's really important that we do. Um, and that's the, the spirit and truth, you know, our actions, they, they prove what we believe and what we don't believe. You know, we act on our beliefs. Um, so that was, that was something else. And when it said about the punishment for the Jews, first of all, what I was reflecting on there is that they had the law and they really did all learn it. And if they didn't do that, having had the law, they would be the first to be punished. And if you look at the Old Testament, they were also punished many times and sent into exile and all these things for not doing what they knew they should do that being commanded by God, you know. Um, so in some ways, we've got it slightly better in, in that respect, at least. Um, and not well, but we don't know now that we have had the Bible, but um, the, the, the Gentiles before did have that plea, if you like. Um, so let me see, there's something else and something else. Um, no, I, I talked about the doers of the law. Um, and again, yeah, let me see. I think that's the size of it, as if that wasn't enough. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that was it. And I think, yeah, that, I think that was the size of it. So <laughs> I've really gone on there, but those, those were my, my thoughts as we yeah. went through that, Dustin. So thanks for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, um, I should just let you talk the entire time because uh, I think you have a good grasp on on what's going on here, and that's good. And and, and we'll we'll do more of this next week, of course. So it will it'll help us to kind of keep some continuity. 
Okay, um, I have another hand that's raised as well. Okay, so uh, for those that, that have questions, uh, let's, let's try to keep them um, uh, concise. I'll do the best I can to explain them and uh, that way we can get everyone to, to get their questions answered. So uh, NT, you're next. Can you hear me well? I'm at my mom's. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay. 10 out of 10. Perfect. All right. So once one, uh, just a one-liner question, and then I have some thoughts. I just want to run by you. Um, uh, now you say in verses one, two, and three, it's like a hypothetical argument. Like it's like, he's, is that how, how would, um, like he's, 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 he is making arguments against a hypothetical Right. Uh, it, I, I think it's 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 actually the the entire passage, but it it seems that Paul is is addressing hypothetical opponents, but in doing so, he's answering objections from them. I don't think Paul is thinking of particular individuals in Rome that he's writing this to to uh, to to fix their misunderstanding per se. Okay. okay, yeah, okay. He, so yeah. yeah, my thoughts were, you know, I'm really glad that you went to. Uh, um, Romans uh, 13, um, because basically what I'm getting out of the gist of this, or part of what I'm getting out of the gist of this, is that in the beginning of chapter two, he's talking about, you know, don't fall to hypocrisy, basically. You know, like, don't, like, like I'm in the middle of working on this right now. One of, one of the leaders in our church is helping me personally, um, and I was being too critical on people, including brothers and sisters, and so I'm learning how to not judge in order to properly judge. And um, like Jesus talks about taking the log out of our eyes before we try to take the speck out of others. Um, but, you know, I, I, I usually when I when I would go to this chapter, I would look at like how God through God's kindness and tolerance and patience, he leads us to repentance. But the more I look at this chapter, it looks like that's I mean, that's certainly valid. But the main theme is that repentance involves the secret of the heart because he starts off the chapter without hypocrisy. And then he and then he ends his point in verse 16, where he says, um, God will judge according to my gospel. God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. It sounds like he's like that's like the conclusion of like bringing up the hypocrisy. And I saw it in chapter 13 when you were going through um, in verse eight. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And then he makes these, then he starts describing the 10 commandments. I think, um, you know, he says to love one another and that, um, even, the not coveting is summed up in loving our neighbors as ourselves and coveting is, I always thought was like a heart issue. You know, I always thought coveting is like, cause I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not totally confident with the idea of coveting and trying to understand it, but it sounds like he, you know, um, uh, that it's the coveting is part of not loving my neighbor and it's just I, I so I, I think the hypocrisy and like trying to repent with the secrets of our heart I mean what's been helping me is fellowship and reaching out to people in, in, in this church and um, it just I don't know does that make sense uh, it sounds like Paul's concluding the point of hypocrisy with the secrets of, of, of yeah his heart. yeah I think I think the it, it's connected because it's hypocritical to think that God is going to judge people differently with different standards when God is going to judge all people according to their works. And so part of Paul detailing the righteousness of God and the righteous behavior of the righteous judge is to indicate that we can't have a hypocrisy. And it's also showing how God is going to judge, which also shows what God is doing in the new covenant right now, which leads us to telling a little bit more about Jesus and his death and resurrection and what th that has accomplished um, as, as the argument continues into chapter two and chapter three of Romans. Yeah, it so, just sounds so. like it's Paul's version of describing when Jesus was on the Sermon on the Mount saying, remove the log out of your eye. <laughs> yeah. It kind of said this with chapter 13, it just kind of sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. Good connection there. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, John, your turn. Thanks, Justin. That was really, really excellent. Um, one of the, th the things that it, it makes me think about is how incredibly important translation is. Um, you know, you go through and you read most of the translations that you listed. Is it verse six, I think? Um, where are the, or 14? It's 14, know. yeah. <clears throat> um, 
And you, you reading those translations, you would never conclude what you're saying, right? And then when you show the Greek and you see that, that the, I forget what the word was, but that it's, it's sitting immediately behind the, the have verb. And, you know, it's in the dative case. It just fits perfectly right there. It doesn't, I mean, it could be in Greek that it's way, it's referring to the verb that's coming later, but that's not, you know, proximity does matter in Greek. And, and uh, so, but I, it reminded me of a book. I don't, I don't know if you've read this book before. You probably have, but um, it's, it, the, the book is called Truth in Translation. And it was by a, 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 a a scholar in Arizona, I want to say that, that he had done a lot of studies on the, the idea of how bias in the translator leads them to translate in ways to support the bias um, against the natural tr way you would translate something. And it seems to me that this is one of those places. I don't remember him covering this verse, um, but but you can kind of immediately see it that I, if I have an, a particular understanding of what Paul is is saying, regardless of what Paul's actually saying, if what my understanding is, then I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, well, it, it can't be this because that would lead me in a different direction than what I already know Paul to be saying. So it's got to be this over here. And subsequently, you get a, a, a misunderstanding of what Paul's saying by every single reader who then reads that translation. And, you know, sometimes there's a tendency to think that, well, if we get too much down into the weeds in terms of translation and um, scholarship and all this kind of stuff um, that, you know, we're, we're, we're missing the the heart of Christianity and those kinds of things. And I think today's teaching demonstrates that that's just, that's a false dichotomy that, that without this kind of work, we, we can so easily be led astray and, and make wrong in assumptions and interpretations that end up leading us into, to error. And um, the final thing I'll, I'll say is that, um, you know, good job. Good job. This is, this was good. Second Timothy two fifteen stuff. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and let me tell you in any time that I'm going to suggest to a church that 99% of translations are wrong. That is a, it, it almost comes across as arrogant. Like I know better than these other people. Like, and so I'm only even going to suggest that if I feel like I can be absolutely clear at, 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 making my point clear and showing to people and showing how persuasive that is. Um, because for the most part, translation translators are right. You know, 99% of the time they get it right. Um, but it's, it's very rare when it seems like almost all of them seem to, to get it wrong. Uh, and so I, I don't make those suggestions um, lightly. Um, I, I'd say those in humility. Um, but, but it's, it's up to you all to decide whether you feel that my argument is persuasive or if I'm misguided. So one, one other quick thing on that truth in translation, it, it was interesting that in your list, the one version that was going, seemed to be anyway, going in the direction of the way that you interpret was the New American Bible. And his conclusion in his book is that the New American Bible is, is pretty much the least biased translation. Yeah. <laughs> And the funny thing about that for Protestants is it's a Catholic Bible. Yep. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's, 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 it's translated by Catholic scholars. I yes. Guess. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. That is, that is right. That is interesting. So don't, don't, don't dog those Catholic scholars. Some of them are very, very good. So, okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Dean and Phyllis, uh, Phyllis, I'm going to have you give, have the last word, but go ahead, Dean. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is really good. Um, I made the notation in my NASB that instinctively should be by nature. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is really good. And, you know, God loves us so much that he warns us. 
and uh, about um, <laughs> being honest and that everything counts in our life. Uh, so this was um, a good thing for me to watch again. Um, but I also want to emphasize how great and how loving and how merciful God really is that he gives us chance after chance after chance that when we repent, he washes all that stuff away. And that is so great. That in itself should cause all of us, myself and everybody else to want to really walk with God. And just to see the amazing love that he's had. First of all, he sacrifices his son, his only perfect son, who never did anything wrong. And then he gives us mercy and grace after grace after grace when we repent. He wants us to have clean hearts and minds. And that is certainly a goal that I have to continue to work on. But that is so great. And uh, yeah, your teaching was outstanding. That's very kind of you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, young lady. My comment is very quick. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, putting this type of um, effort and love really to, to really dig into this, it just opens things up to us in a whole new way. And I really appreciate it. Everyone else has said it but I appreciate it uh, so deeply. And uh, it made me realize so much of what I thought I knew was based on sound bites. And um, it's, it's much deeper, it's, it's so much more deeper. And the way you uh, sort of let it open up for us and how you unpacked it, as you said, it really uh, made me think about things that and think about it, it cleared up a lot. And we will definitely be going over this and over this. And uh, it's almost like I got to see, at, at first I was thinking the, the law, he was talking about the new law when it first began in Romans. But you showed us he was talking about the law of Moses. And then we could actually see it start to transition into the new covenant law. It's, it's like I could, I could see the transitioning going on. And um, anyway, I'm not, I just wanted to say thank you, Dustin. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to help in whatever ways I can contribute. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep working together and learning to, appreciate what Paul has written together. And uh, I don't have all the answers, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you all what little I have. So, okay. Um, okay. We get, we get one last hand. Okay. So Donna, I, I, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> yeah, I, went, I came in last for a reason. You know, I sounds sort of absurd because I've been a Christian for 40 some years. That doesn't mean that I understood the book of Romans. And I think it was the hardest book for me to comprehend. I knew that there was a lot of ambiguity in it, but I never, unfortunately, you know, I didn't get down to the lexicons. And I'm glad you mentioned the BDAD and, and you know, uh, going deeper, which, you know, I haven't, I've been very, a, a very lazy reader um, in having to admit my, my flaw there, my fault. I realize that it takes a work to understand biblical language and background. And um, we, you know, I'm not going to criticize many churches, but the theology is so, God, my heart just is beginning to understand the implications of Oseph. And many people are taught to disregard their theology, thinking that the only thing, you know, if you got your basic doctrine and love, just go there. And I listened to an oldie but goodie. I know it was 2006, but for me, it was new, Dustin. And I, 
have you ever done a Q&A with the Father God? And so I did a Q&A question. What is sin, Lord? This is kind of tr very transparent here for me after 40 years, 40 some years. So my question, what is sin? What does it look like? And I've been asking this question. You have to understand where I'm coming from. You know, I was a once saved, always saved individual for eons. And it's only been the last 10 years, 15 years that I'm pulling out of that um, false doctrine and coming to realize the devastation of life when we aren't truthful, no matter how people react to truth. It needs to be told because we're saving them from eternal death, you know, and my heart feels very pierced. And I think this is a good piercing. This is a good piercing of scripture where, you know, some people, you know, see description goes, oh, you know, there's just so much power. But what about the power of conviction and, you know, being corrected and, you know, you talk about the kindness of God, you know, giving you a chance to repent. And I think for me, this is so real that whom the father loves, he corrects, but you got to listen. You got to be open to um, interpretation other than the one that you were taught that is false. And so I know I'm saying a lot of stuff here, Dustin, which is not new to you because you were raised right. I was raised by wolves, so I wasn't raised right. No excuse. But, you know, I listened to the that. Um, the uh, I know it's an all day thing for you, but what is sin? And I loved, I didn't know to get on there. I didn't know to get on and listen to Dustin Smith and Sean Finnegan. It was the Lord responding to my honest question. Honest question. What does sin look like, Lord? I, you know, it's, I have my right. I have a right to ask him so that he can show me the truth and I don't fall prey to wolves within the church that don't do their job of correcting and training, being all about their position and money and afraid to correct, afraid to see, you know, the congregation and to help them out of sin and to be, you know, and, and to reprove, rebuke, correct, if I understand this correctly from First Timothy. So, you know, I want to thank you for the work that you do, Dustin, because I truly have gained strength striving against, um, you know, the OSAP and coming to a place of, you know, repentance myself in many categories. And I'm not afraid to say it because somebody got to say it. Somebody got to wake up and say, I'm woke, but in a good way. So I just really appreciate you, Dustin. Well, I, you're, you're very kind. I, I appreciate that. I, I just, I want, want to make sure that, you know, we are, I'm just pointing you to the words of Paul. So, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. I'm just telling you what I think Paul has said. So, uh, but hopefully encouraging people to be able to read Paul for themselves and uh, being able to kind of take a little bit better ownership of their own faith. So, okay. Um, if you've made it this far into the teaching, uh, congratulations, uh, clap for you and pat on the back and everything. Um, uh, next week, we'll do the rest of Romans chapter two. You're welcome to read ahead, uh, meditate on those and come back with your questions. Um, if you're watching and uh, you uh, would like to join us, uh, check us out in the description of the video for how to get in contact with us. We'd love to have you for fellowship. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Appreciate it.